All right, so uh, yeah, we've updated the final exam time since I made a mistake there. Thank you guys for bringing that to my attention. We are going to obviously continue on lecturing. We're on to chapter nine, which is a fun one, uh, at least for me. And we're going to kind of talk our way through it and really applying it because effectively up until now, we've kind of been putting everything together, just kind of understanding each of the individual systems, but now kind of like, okay, what's the driving mechanisms, methods that are going to get us to make whatever changes we're looking for. So hence, we want to make sure we're taking a principled approach where we understand what we're doing. So uh, before we get into that, and specifically the quote at the bottom of your screen, which hopefully you can, uh, you guys can read, it's not too small for you, um, in that anything that I'm answering in these lectures, if you email me about them, and I don't respond to your email within uh, 48 hours, figure it was in the lecture, so you should be listening to the lecture anyways. I'm saying this, of course, to the people in the lectures that are not the ones that are emailing me this, but uh, we currently have 24 people in the class, and we have markedly less than 24 people in the lecture today. So, you know, it's uh, when you get 10 or more emails all asking the same question that we covered in class, it becomes a little frustrating. Now, for your lab on Friday, it's the sub max VO2 testing, which you're going to do walking on a treadmill, where you're going to be measuring your heart rate. Now, obviously, in a perfect world, we would prefer a partner for you guys when you're doing that. Um, but obviously that requires taking a type of pulse. Now I want you to take the wrist pulse or take your pulse off of an Apple watch or whatever type of method you have for heart rate collection. Do not use the hand grips on the ends of the treadmill to determine your heart rate. Cause that's going to make it easier, which is then going to lower your heart rate. Otherwise make sure we're following the methodology that's outlined in the lab. And then from there, when you guys come in on Friday, we're gonna go ahead and talk through those wonderful metabolic responses you guys had, the VO2 estimates that you came up with. Remember, college age females are usually between 40 and 45, males are between 45 and 50, and like the best that we've ever recorded in the lab, and that's with the cross country males, uh, was barely over 70. So if your numbers get to be Fruit Loops high, which is very possible, and we'll talk about why that can be, whenever you guys come in on Friday, uh, don't necessarily think you made a mistake with your math, but it is gonna take some time. So make sure you guys uh, bang that out before you guys come to class. And altogether, the testing on the treadmill really only takes 12 minutes. It's actually only three different uh, three minute stages and give you a little bit of lag time on either side. Now, let us all read the quote at the bottom of the screen. Is anyone in, unable to read it? And if so, I will go ahead and read it out loud to you guys. Yes, if you're doing the firefighter study, you do not need to do the submax lab because you're already living that four different times. All right, so since all of you guys can read that without issue, who wants to go ahead and explain to everybody what you think that means. All right. Abby, what do you think that means? All right, Colleen, what do you think it means? Um, I think principles are more of like the why you do something and methods are more of how. So there could be a million ways to do something, but the reason why there are only a few. So the man who grasps principles knows why you do it and then selects 
how he does it. But the man who only knows how he does it and, and ignores why you do it is having trouble. That is a great way to approach that. Good job. Um, another little thing that I'd throw on there is it's more of if I give you guys every single, I put you guys into a wood shop. So you've got, you know, a bunch of different types of saws. You've got sanders, you've got routers, you've got chisels, you've got all this equipment. Well, if you understand the, the principles behind woodworking, where we're talking about really, we're just using a different type of tip to remove a certain amount of wood at a time, whether it's obviously a giant saw blade or just a thin chisel or sandpaper, but that's the basic principle. If all you know is how to use a hammer, well, then all of a sudden <clears throat> everything looks like a nail and you wonder why they don't make any progress. Not bad, no, not bad with the teach a man to fish idea. So the big reasons why we care about the principles on our side, guys, is one, yes, it's going to allow you to select a program and develop a program that is effective for the individual you're working with accordance to their goals. Two, you're less likely to fall prey to charlatans and well-meaning people that are giving forth less than effective and less than useful training advice. So if we understand the principles, the basics of what we're trying to accomplish and how it all comes together, we are going to be not just better practitioners, but we're also gonna be better educators and advocates. Because like anything else, it's easy to become very dogmatic about, oh, if you want to be awesome, you need to get into CrossFit. You need to get into long distance running. You need to get into heavy weight training. Well, there's a lot of different ways that we can define all of these things. Instead, it's important to figure out, okay, what are going to be the most effective modalities given the goal of the individual working with? So with that now started, let's go ahead and talk through we're going to go through some basic terminology, but then we're going to really hit our five basic principles of training. This is going to show up in your assignments, on your exam or quizzes, and on your final exam. If you don't figure out by the time you get to your final exam, we're going to talk about a lot today, then it's not going to be good on your grade. It's 100% honest with you guys. But then we're going to talk about how we're going to apply this basic concept to resistance training, and then also to, we can refer to it as energy systems training, or conditioning, but we're talking about anaerobic, anaerobic style training programs. So the first term we have is just good old basic strength. And this is gonna be how much force that we can produce. This is going to be based upon one muscle group or a number of muscles. So we're doing a compound movement. This can be static, so an isometric, uh, kind of like we do the hand grip dynamometer or obviously dynamic, obviously when you guys were doing your actual machine lifting. And then the one, rep repetition, one repetition maximum, that's just the highest load that you can lift with only uh, one rep. Now, muscular power, if you guys remember back to biomechanics, this is going to be our full force multiplied by the distance it covers in the time it does so. So work, remember, is just force times distance, but if we cover that distance in a shorter period of time, we're out, or in whatever period of time we're doing, that's the amount of power. If the amount of time is shorter, then it's more powerful. So as a weight is dropped in my lap, um, power is going to be pretty much the most important factor. It's going to be what we're really looking at, not just with sporting success, but just general overall life. If you have more power, absolute and relative to your body weight, activities of daily living are far much easier for you. And if you slip, you're more likely to catch yourself. It's something that's gonna actually help you stay safe. Now, a number of those fields tests are not specific. This right here is actually an isokinetic uh, dynamometer. There's one downstairs in the athletic training room. And you can test people's strength on that and like, wow, kind of like do the leg extension. Like, great, we can see how your quads work. But that doesn't give us an idea of your squatting ability, your ability to lunge, your ability to deadlift. So now muscular endurance is our ability to perform a number of contractions or maintaining a traction over a long period of time. So Repeated contractions, now we're talking about repetition tests, push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, uh, 225-pound bench press, hence why we have the numbers down here. Or then we have things like our ability to sustain a single contraction. That can be something like a plank hold. 
Now, like anything else, our muscular endurance goes up when our maximal strength goes up as to when we improve our energy system's ability. So those local muscles ability to perform and our cardiovascular system's ability to deliver nutrients to those areas. So this is just a basic uh, comparison of three different athletes that obviously have very different strength levels. However, their power relationships are actually, even though this athlete only has literally half the strength of athlete B, because they're able to move that maximum so quickly, they actually are, in this case, twice as powerful. Now, when it comes to the ability to do repetition endurance, that's where we see athlete B comes forward and has a better performance in both athletes C and A. And either way, these are pretty damn impressive numbers because if you've got a guy that can do a 200 kilogram bench press is 440 pounds, that's pretty darn strong, unless they're just a very large land mammal in the first place. And then to do 10 repetitions at 150 kilos, which means 330 pounds, much less five reps of 330 pounds, that is once again, a pretty strong human. Now think about it from athletics, okay? If our goal is to be the better power lifter, we only care about strength. However, if our goal is to be a great shot putter, um, thrower, any type of athlete that has a power component, well, in reality, even though athlete B is so much stronger than athlete A, when we're looking at the probably the potential to throw a shot put, A or C is probably gonna be better than athlete B. And then finally, when we're looking at sheer repetition endurance, obviously both of these athletes have a pretty good endurance at what would effectively be 75% of their maximum. And this athlete would have much less endurance there, which remember guys, that probably could be potentially due to fiber type differences. Well, when do we want athletes to have much greater endurance? Well, if they obviously playing a sport with a very great endurance component. So like anything else, all this information is useful and that's gonna lend itself into those major principles of training, which we're gonna get into. Now, aerobic power is literally our ability to maintain aerobic performance. So we're delivering enough oxygen to the muscles we're using to maintain our performance. So this is gonna be about the same as aerobic capacity, maximal O2 uptake or VO2 max, which is what we're gonna use the most. This is mostly limited by the cardiovascular system, but it can also be limited obviously by your muscles ability to utilize oxygen aerobically and your capillarization, which is part of the cardiovascular system's ability to deliver oxygen. And really we're talking blood to those areas. Now we're going to be doing the VO2 max at one point in the lab. We'll video one of you guys and you guys can all see it. And those of you guys doing the fire gear study, you've already got to live it and it is not pleasant, but it is a good way that we can get an idea of someone's aerobic capacity. Now, anaerobic power is that same type of energy systems, but only now we're talking about uh, ATP, PCR and or anaerobic glycolysis. Now, you guys have already lived this by having to do variations on the Wingate test. I love this picture because that is definitely someone who's trying to encourage someone to give their greatest possible efforts into a uh, wonderful Wingate test. Now, obviously this is pre-COVID, but like anything else, it's a good indicator of someone's anaerobic ability and how much power they're gonna be able to put out within relatively limited periods of time because we're once again, remember those metabolic byproducts are gonna get you. So any questions about our basic terminology before we start going into our principles of training? Okay, so let's start breaking down our five major principles of training. First one being individuality. And this is straight up genetics, lifestyle, training histories, all of those things are going to influence very much so what type of training someone is going to respond to. Thanks to the joys of everyone's got different parents, or obviously you have siblings, but thanks to all of that variability, we're not all going to respond the same to training. 
Some folks are gonna make much greater progress on a program than others. Some folks might even regress on a given program. And it's not necessarily due to a lack of adherence, a lack of effort. Instead, you need to keep in mind that once again, due to the differences of one individual to another, you're never gonna have a homogenous response. So this is something to be very careful of. What accidents do you guys see quite frequently when it comes to people applying or misapplying really this principle to other folks and their training? All three of you guys gave great examples. So yes, trying to take an 80 year old, relatively sedentary individual and try to turn him into a hardcore power lifter overnight sounds like a great way to help make an orthopedic surgeon a lot of money. Uh, people that are following workouts that are for our other individuals. Doesn't matter how much I try to follow uh, a female Instagram butt models training program, I'm never gonna look like her for obvious anthropometric differences, just the nature of the beast. I can grow my hair out though. Um, and whenever I see you guys in the lab on Friday, if you guys want a funny story, I've got a pretty funny one, um, kind of adjacent to that. And absolutely overworking because this is the program that worked for me, bro. I don't understand why it doesn't work for you. Yes, great job, Evan, making the whole team run the same amount, especially when we have sports of, and we're getting into the next one in a moment, which is specificity where we've got not just athletes of varying levels of fitness, but then we also have just different goals. How far a lineman has to run is gonna be very different than how much a wide receiver will run during a football game. And same thing when we look at a sport like soccer between a midfielder, a forward, a defensive player, and a goalie. So keeping in mind that yes, you'll see ideas from other people's programs. And there's some things to perhaps experiment with on occasion, but don't just take another person's program and run it for yourself. Unless you happen to have a genetic identical twin and the programs worked pretty darn well for them, then even then, it'll, yeah, it's got a better chance of working well for you. But the other thing to keep in mind when we talk about individuality, you need to keep in mind not just genetics, but lifestyle. If you guys have a stressful job, you have a number of stressful relationships, you are already well-trained, you are not very well-trained, you are coming back from an injury, you've got a chronic type of injury you have to baby. All of these things are gonna all play into your body's response to a training program. Now, the next major principle is specificity. Our body is going to get better at the things that we are specifically doing. So, if we want to get stronger, we should probably have strength training in the program. If we want to get better endurance, we should have a conditioning component in the program. And obviously, if we want better mobility, flexibility, we should have that in the program. Now, this is relatively straightforward, but you'd be surprised at how many people will fall short on this when they actually take a look at their own program. So our body is going to adapt not just to the activity we're doing, but the amount of work we're doing, so that's the training volume and the intensity that we're doing it. So with Henneman's size principle, which we've covered before and you guys talked about on one of your take-home assignments, remember, as we try to produce a greater and greater amount of force, we're gonna recruit more and more muscle fibers inside of that given muscle. So if our goal is to make that muscle as powerful as it can be, well, we need to make sure we're always tapping into those type two fibers and specifically getting into those type two X fibers. And that requires at some point doing high speed, high power work. If you're never doing that or potentially very high resistance, if you're never doing that, you're never tapping into those fibers. And due to such, you're not going to have that long-term training effect that you're really looking for. So when it comes to principle of specificity, folks, what have you guys seen where people are violating this with their program?
What can you guys think of would be an example of violating the specificity with a training program? Randall, a great example. Yeah, a wide receiver working on their distance running. Yeah, the football field is only 100 yards from end zone to end zone. The furthest in theory an athlete would have to run. And mind you, you could have a very circuitous route, but we're still talking about not even 200 yards. So anything beyond that distance, well, they're now running for their life. And that's a different thing to train for. And so we're not really helping ourselves out. Now, a good point that you do touch you're getting into there, uh, Rollin, which is absolutely programs can be a little too general. And especially what I find is absolutely hilarious um, is the folks that want to, when they say tone up, they're really talking about a combination of losing body fat while they gain lean mass. Now, typically what a lot of folks want to do is typically have a smaller waist and really looking for a more aesthetically pleasing build. You know, they want to have a certain type of aesthetic they're going for. So whenever you meet someone that's trying to do said toning up so they can be lean, you know, leaner so they can look better and they're doing side bends, I always find it interesting because your muscles only really do one thing with resistance training guys. And what's that? What's really the only thing a muscle could do thanks to your training? Exactly, Evan, get bigger. So now if you keep making your obliques bigger, thicker muscles, you're naturally gonna make your waist wider because you've got thicker muscles on the outside. Does that actually make you look better? No. And the same thing is arguably true with training your abs. You can hypertrophy your abs if they're larger. If you need examples of that, look up uh, like strongmen and you can see how they have effectively the power belly part of it is due to adipose. The other part is simply because they've got a lot of muscle mass there that keeps them safe when they're doing very, very heavy lifting. The other one that's entertaining is folks that are doing uh, like hip adduction and abduction machines at the rec center. When once again, the only thing your muscles, your legs are going to do is get bigger from training. And I don't think a lot of people are trying to get really thick adductors. So that way, you know, when they're walking around, their thighs naturally are going to rub together and their thighs recreationally eat pants because unfortunately I'm in that um, bracket, but that's more or less just due to years and years of very, very heavy lifting. And those muscles stabilize you and keep you safe when once again, you're under heavy loading. But I don't think a lot of people are really striving um, for that type of, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's good to have when you're being safe, but I don't think a lot of people are naturally looking for a blocky waist and those other type of aesthetic uh, changes. If you are, more power to you, but a lot of folks aren't necessarily thinking through what are going to be the long-term effects of their sport training. And the other thing that's really entertaining in that most of the people, what basic movement pattern does nearly every single sport, or refer, not movement pattern might not be fair to you guys, what part of your body are you going to use in every single sport? It's really going to be your legs. Like that's pretty much the, the reoccurring theme. So, but how many bros at the rec want to be better at basketball and they will refuse to ever even walk into a squat rack to do anything other than a curl inside of it? Because yes, every day is chest day and I don't need to train my legs, man. I play basketball twice a week. So my legs are huge. And that's, an example of, once again, violating specificity. If their legs were stronger, more powerful, they'd probably be a better basketball player. But that requires doing lifts that are very uncomfortable. And that's probably the, the gentlest way I can go ahead and describe that. So when you're looking at a training program, we should see elements that are going to help develop the overall individual. And that's the thing. Having stronger legs is useful for every part of your life, from climbing stairs to getting up and out of a chair to obviously being able to carry objects and move yourself around. Yes, you need a certain amount of core stability. Yes, you need a certain amount of upper body strength, but like anything else, we should see those elements in there. And then when it comes to specificity, the other thing we need to be keeping in mind when we're talking about athletes and athletic populations is decreasing risk of injury. So what's gonna be the injuries we see most frequently in basketball? Turns out sprained 
uh, jammed fingers and sprained ankles. That happens all the time. What are we doing to help diminish that risk? If we're talking about soccer, uh, specifically women's soccer, we're talking about a pretty solidly increased risk, risk of ACL tears. Obviously, with football, we're talking about concussion risk. So what are going to be the different things that we can at least try to control on the training side to help decrease the risk of those things occurring, aside from don't play the sport? Now, the next one we have is just good old reversibility. If you are not using it, you will, in fact, lose it. So like anything else, when we train, we're going to get better at both our strength and endurance. When we stop training, it's going to go backwards. This is the unfortunate rule of the world, which is, yes, your body is not being in shape, carrying around lots of muscle mass and otherwise is energetically expensive for the body. So it wants to have as little muscle mass as it can get by for the activities of daily living that is required to do. It doesn't really care about how much fat mass it's carrying. It tries to carry as much of that as it possibly can just so that you've got a caloric reserve in case anything goes wrong. So like anything else, if we're not training it, it's probably going back. Different things go back at different speeds. So your top speed, your peak power, that's going to go down within about a week of no longer doing concerted effort in that area. Whereas Things like our anaerobic power, our anaerobic endurance, that's going to go down after about two weeks significantly, mean like a 5% loss, which is still a notable loss that anyone would notice with their own training. And then your maximal strength and aerobic ability is actually going to take about a month to go down. So that's why when you're working with athletes, when we're in season, especially near the end of the season, we can cut back on our max strength and aerobic conditioning components because we probably have already made as much progress as we're going to get. Now we don't have to worry about recovering from this extra amount of stress we're putting on the athlete. And instead, let's make sure we keep that speed and that power up since that's probably what makes the difference between winning and losing in a lot of athletic endeavors. Now, this one I think is relatively simple and straightforward. The one thing I would throw out to you guys is when it comes to reversibility, what can you guys think of as you would convert from one athletic endeavor to another what you would potentially lose. What do you guys think that you would potentially lose? Okay, this was meant to be a pretty broad and open question, obviously. So when you say from one sport to another, now, yeah, you could lose strength, you could lose power, you could lose endurance, you could lose a litany of things. So if you're going, let's say we've got a collegiate, uh, not collegiate athlete, we're going to say we've got a three sport um, high school athlete. They go from playing, uh, we'll say, uh, is softball in the state of Kentucky, is that a fall sport? It's spring. Okay. When's volleyball? Okay. So let's say we've got a, we've got a high school female athlete. She plays volleyball in the fall. She plays basketball in the winter. And then in the spring, she's playing softball. So when she's converting from being a volleyball player to being a basketball player, what do you think she's going to potentially lose a little bit of because she's also having to gain something else. Potentially mobility, depending on uh, the positions and required there. Potentially power, because now what is she really having to develop that isn't really as big of a factor when it comes to volleyball? Endurance, thank you. So then, and conditioning is another good catch all way to explain it. And I, I do like that approach too. Now, when that athlete goes from being a, a basketball player into a softball player, what do you think she's probably going to be gaining? Yeah, power and definitely potentially strength. What is she probably losing? Yeah, losing a bit of that conditioning. 
So it's the nature of the beast when you're talking about a multi-sport athlete or really anyone is that you're going to go through different times of the year. And yes, when you talk about the conditioning, there is a difference between the anaerobic conditioning and the aerobic conditioning. So great job pointing that out, Colleen. It's more the aerobic conditioning that would probably go down. The anaerobic power is still going to be there and the power endurance, but things have gone horribly wrong in a softball game or horribly right, depending on if you're running the base path, if you happen to have to put forth an effort for more than 10 seconds straight. So just keeping in mind, reversibility doesn't necessarily mean you're just sitting on the couch and that's everything's reversing. Instead, think at certain points, your emphasis is going to change. And as that emphasis changes, certain things are naturally going to go back while certain things naturally go forward. It's incredibly difficult, especially as you become more and more well-trained to improve everything at the same time. So you're going to naturally do concerted blocks of effort in your training where you're really focusing on developing one element or another. Now, the next big linchpin when it comes to any training program, so anytime you look at a program, it should have some form of progressive overload, literally meaning that we are now making the body do more work so that it has to get better than it was beforehand. Now, there is a wide variety of ways that we can overload our muscles. Now, this can be because, well, go ahead and I'll have you guys list out some ways that you think that we can go ahead and progress the program. Absolutely, we can add weight. What else can we do? We can add reps to the same weight. Yep, we can decrease rest. Yes, we can increase the time under tension so we can purposely try to control the eccentric for a longer period of time. So the lowering phase of the lift so that we're under the bar for a longer period. Hmm. Now, increasing uh, duration, when we're talking about resistance training, yes, Colleen, frequency, how many times you work out per week along with how many sets of that exercise we're doing. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by uh, add fatigue but that could be kind of a pre-exhaust type situation you might be referring to, or training once again more frequently so you still have some fatigue that you have to overcome. But either way, there's a myriad of ways you can improve your programming or your training with time. The same thing when it comes to aerobic style training. No, it's okay, it's okay. It's the joys of putting things up in the chat rapidly, which is we can obviously have to do the same distance in a shorter period of time. We can try to do a greater distance in the same period of time, we can do a more challenging course of the same distance in the same period of time. And if you're really feeling saucy, you could even throw on a weight vest if you wanna know what pain really is as another way to go ahead and adapt things. And the other thing, you can always change your surface to make it more difficult. So running on, um, oh, looks like we, uh, oh no, Colleen's back in there. Colleen and Abby, what is probably the easiest surface for you guys to go running on? And what would you say is the most difficult surface for you guys to go running on? As in, it's just, it's more tiring to go the same distance or the same speed. Yes, running on the sand is brutal. So like anything else, there's a number of different ways we can progress the program. We don't have to be just married to we always increase the distance we ran or we always increase the weight on the bar. Mm -hmm. Just because of the looseness and your, yeah, the lack of traction you can get on occasion, especially the speeds you guys are going. So we're just going to always look for some form of progression. <laughs> you don't run on ice, you slip and fall on it, or you skate on ice if you're going to do that, Evan. But absolutely, snow is another thing that is pretty difficult as well. So when we're going to do some form of progression, okay. We just need some way of making the program more difficult. It doesn't necessarily need to be, we're only progressing in one way, shape or another, but typically when you're working with someone, let's start off with one simple form of progression, run that model for a little bit, and then we'll switch over to another form of progression. And different forms of progression are ones that are gonna be more useful for different endeavors. So if our goal was to really increase maximal strength, okay, what do you think we probably, what type of progression do we want to do with our resistance training of all the different ones that you guys listed before?
if our goal is to increase strength, we want to add weight. Makes sense because we're lifting a heavier load. Now, increasing reps is an option there, okay? But if I said our goal is to increase muscular endurance, what would you then think would be the good decision to go with? It's okay. Internet connections can be choppy. That's why we talk, guys. Turns out no one's got any uh, demerits for answering questions so far today in class. It's just kind of talk things through. But if our goal was to increase muscular endurance with resistance training, what type of progression model do you think you'd want to use then? Absolutely, Abby. More reps and let's decrease our rest intervals between sets as another way to help force those changes to occur. And if our goal is to increase muscular size, what do you think we want to do there when it comes to our progression? <laughs> Time under tension is a great way to look at it. This is typically going to be through potentially increasing the number of reps at a given weight and increasing the number of sets that you're doing. So you're doing more and more sets to induce more and more fatigue. But like anything else, strength and hypertrophy are going to be related. So a bigger muscle tends to be a stronger muscle. So the same thing that progresses one with the other tends to carry over pretty well. That being said, muscular endurance tends to also be correlated with hypertrophy. So working kind of in between those two ends of the spectrum, and we'll get to some examples of this later on is a good way to try to increase muscle mass. So any questions on basics of progression? <laughs> Looks like no. So the final of our five different principles of training is gonna be variation, okay? This is also referred to sometimes as the principle of periodization in that over time, we are going to change our variables in our program so that we're going to hit a physical peak of performance and then typically allow a deload and then repeat and try to get to a peak of performance. If you keep running the same program over and over again, like anything else, or not the same not program, the same workout over and over again, your body is going to adapt to it. You're not gonna change much anymore you're gonna have a certain amount of monotony, which also increases your risk for injury because of overuse since you're doing the same movement pattern over and over again. So we wanna have a certain amount of variability in our training that we don't wanna do the exact same sets, reps, percentages every single training session. We want to give ourselves a little bit more of a variety of stimuli so the body effectively has still a concerted specific forces or a stimulus to adapt to but it's not the exact same stimulus over and over again. So it ex what can you guys think of would be a training style that abuses potentially the principle of variation? And I'm kind of speaking with stereotypes here in that how it's applied sometimes where you've got so much variation, you're not really making much concerted progress. Yes, and now that you guys have said it, I don't have to. Now, on the other side, you can have that, maybe you guys have had that friend or you've known that person, they just do the same workout every day. You know, they do the one punch man, they run 10, uh, what, 10 kilometers, 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, and 100 squats. Like, yeah, I mean, you can do that, but at some point, it's just the same thing over and over again. And you're not gonna make much change at all. You're just gonna hit a plateau where you stay along with you're once again increasing that risk of injury because you're just doing the same essential four different exercises without any variation. So we want to have a certain amount of variety in our program, initially with a greater amount of overall volume, but a lower intensity, meaning lower effort overall, lower percentages of our max outputs on the lifting we're doing, on the running we're doing, et cetera. Then as we get closer to our competition, we're going to decrease our volume. So we're not gonna be doing as many total uh, sets and reps, not as many total miles, but we're doing them at a much higher intensity so that we can peak out and then effectively perform at a much higher level. So uh, speaking of um, Abby and Colleen, 
when do you guys get to hit your taper before your uh, conference meets? And yeah, I mean, that's probably when you guys really do try to taper it. So when do they start cutting back your guys' volume before a major competition you actually care about? Okay, when do you guys hit your greatest training volume? And I'm referring to like weekly volume. What week of the season does that tend to be? Okay, so you guys are escalating three, down one, escalating three, so kind of a sawtooth pattern of progression or wave progression. And that's absolutely an effective way to go ahead and do programming with an athlete. Now, like anything else, you need to figure out, go back to the individuality. Are they adapting? Specificity, are they adapting in the ways that you're looking them to? Are we progressing them in a way that's intelligent? We don't really have to worry about uh, going backwards with them because the only thing they care about, they're, what's their training on, so that's fine. And then obviously variation is it's not the same workout every single week. And obviously different components of them are going to be training or changing with their training. Does anyone have any questions about our five basic principles of training? Now, the other component I want to touch on, which is more of a subset of specificity, and that's more of the principle that I like to refer to as generalization, which is if you're very good in this given exercise, activity, or otherwise, it tends to carry over very well to everything else you do. But that also brings up the, con uh, sorry, the concept of what's known as transference, how much you're going to improve in the thing you care about thanks to training X, Y, or Z. And the greater amount of transfer you have from what you're training to what you're trying to get better at, the better choices you're making with your training. Now, obviously for things like long distance running, you can train long distance running and get in, it's a simple one-to-one -one ratio. They're doing the things they need to do to get better. But other things like wrestling, mixed martial arts, boxing or otherwise, you can't go live against somebody every single day of the week because that's just gonna beat you down and get you hurt. So instead we're looking at things that are gonna give us a great deal of transfer. So. What exercise in, uh, we're going to say, the gym when it comes to resistance training, do you feel is going to have the greatest carryover to general overall health lifestyle performance? No worries. What exercise could you choose to do at the rec that is probably going to have the best amount of carryover to just overall lifestyle, overall health, general performance? Now, I did say resistance training. So we'll get there in a moment with cardiovascular choices, Abby, but we'll, that's not bad. That's not bad could definitely be squatting. It uses the core, it uses all of the muscular musculature of the lower body. That is potentially a really great carryover one because that's how we move our body for the most part. Most people don't ever really lift a heavy load with their hands. Not bad, Courtney, but once again, we're getting more into the aerobic component. We'll get there in a few, okay? What other resistance training exercises would you say that have a really good carryover to overall life? Yeah, essentially the power clean. It's picking something off off the ground. It's being powerful. It's using nearly every single muscle group in the body. The snatch would be another potential one. Obviously, it requires a lot of high speed, a lot of coordination, a lot of mobility, uh, especially if we're not talking just the power clean, but we can do the clean and jerk and the, uh, the snatch. So you can't really be weak anywhere if you're doing those movements. So absolutely. 
was actually having a good conversation with a neighbor this weekend when it came to overhead squatting, which is if you're good at overhead squatting, not only are you strong, but you also have great mobility. You can be a great deadlifter and not have good mobility. Now, let's say, okay, on the cardio side, if you can only pick one type of cardiovascular training modality, what probably has the best carryover to everyday life? And we'll just think about all the different machines of the rec, which one has the least carryover? Was that supposed to be the best carryover or the least carryover there, Colleen? Not bad, not bad. Cycling though is an awesome choice for aerobic performance. It's gonna allow you to put in a lot of great effort. We don't have to worry about people that are really big or really small having issues with impacts on being very large because it turns out you're just pedaling the bike. You don't have to worry about the impacts and going, but it turns out that position is not very specific to carrying over. Honestly, it's probably walking on an inclined treadmill is probably gonna be one of the things that has the greatest carryover or walking up the stairs and then walking the track and not even getting on where machines probably has the best carryover. Think about if you saw somebody trying to walk down the street in the same position as they ride a stationary bike, or much less you saw somebody trying to walk down the street, I guess we hop down the street in the same position you're on when you're on a rowing machine. Do those really have a direct carryover to life? Not really, but it is a good way to train our cardiovascular system, which we're going to well, okay, so let's go back to specificity, specifically with aerobic training. This is a solid point to end up on, okay? When it comes to specificity, we got stair climbing, we got the stationary bike, I talked about walking, we've got elliptic killing it, you've got a lot of different cardiovascular choices you can do. Now, what parts of the cardiovascular system are always going to be being used, irregardless of the different aerobic training modality you use. What parts of your aerobic system are no matter what you do gonna be being used? The heart, the lungs, and what else? The blood, absolutely guys. The key difference between all those is gonna be the muscles we're using. And then obviously the capillaries, those individual fibers that are getting fed that we're using. So if our goal is just to live longer and be healthier, it doesn't matter what form of cardio you use because it turns out you're gonna have a healthier cardiopulmonary system, lower likelihood of heart attacks, strokes, et cetera. However, if you go ahead and you wanna be really good at long distance running, well, we need to be doing long distance running. And if we can't be doing long distance running, we should probably be on a treadmill. If we're not on a treadmill, maybe on a bike, maybe on elliptical, if we can't be on those, then we're talking about being on a rowing machine. And if we can't be on a rowing machine, maybe we're just swimming. But swimming is gonna have the least carryover of all those options compared to just flat out doing the running in the first place. So that's another thing to keep in mind. I apologize for going over guys. Any questions, comments, concerns before we wrap up for the day? And I really appreciate you guys for uh, giving me some solid feedback today in the chat. Questions, comments, concerns. Oh, you're good. You're good. Take your time. Otherwise, guys, you guys go and have a nice day. Uh, yes, Jessica, you should try to get that information from you or you do it. 
Um, homework quiz, yeah, should be due on Wednesday. And then quiz is due, yeah, it should be due by 2.32, which is obviously the end of the class. And then as far as the limits to strength, yeah, definitely on Friday. Now, since you guys are still here, and honestly, when I post this, guys, very few people listen to it, like, because I that's why I put it up there so I can see how many views it's had and hint, not many. When you guys are thinking about limits to strength, okay, you need to think about obviously our muscle insertion. So, like, how good our leverages are, how big our muscles can actually be, because as your muscles get bigger and bigger, the issue that we're going to have is literally. So like a small muscle is just, oh, my sister's the artist, remember guys, is just gonna pull on that straight line. But as your muscle gets to be like super soldier strong, well, we've got fibers that are now pulling in this angle and we've got fibers that are pulling in this angle. And if you think back to your trig, your fibers become less and less efficient as they become bigger and bigger. So literally, yeah, there's just gonna be a certain point where you've maxed out the strength of that individual muscle in those given limbs. The other thing to keep in mind is as you get to be bigger and bigger, you now have more and more mass that your body simply has to hold up, that it has to carry. So that's what's known as allometric scaling. So what you're going to find in like, it's, it's the reason why ants are so strong relative to their body weight, because their bodies are very light. So they don't have as much internal mass they have to lift. Whereas, don't get me wrong, the world's best deadlifters have pulled well over a thousand pounds but they also weigh well over 400 pounds, which means they're not even a three times body weight deadlifter. And I say that not necessarily trying to denigrate. Um, I've deadlifted well over three times my body weight before. I think my best I got to was, uh, well, I definitely did the seven, yeah, I did the 716 and 198. So I went a little over three and a half times body weight for um, my best competition uh, measure deadlift. So, like anything else, allometric scaling is going to be a problem. Obviously, muscle size is going to be a problem. Our leverages are going to be limiting our tendons. In theory, it can only deal with so much force before they might go to snap city. And same thing with our bones. Like at certain points, bones are just going to have kind of a functional limit. So there's a lot of different ways to slice it. I hope that was useful for you guys. Uh, does that clear everything up for you, Colleen? And does anyone else have any questions? And I did record that, so you guys can just re-listen to that at the very end. So rock and roll. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good question. I enjoy working with you guys. It's weird talking to myself for you know an hour. So I'm glad that one of you guys gave me some stuff back. So you guys stay safe out there. I will see you guys on Wednesday when we're going to go ahead and wrap up the rest of chapter nine. And then remember, on good old Friday, we're going to have some fun with talking about how our submax testing went. So stay safe out there, guys. Bye-bye.